Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Welcome to Hopkinton Vineyard. We're happy that you're here. Hey, welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. We're so glad you're here. Hope you have a great day. Hi, welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. We are glad you're here. Well, good morning. Welcome to Vineyard Church of Hopkinton. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. We're so happy that you're here with us worshiping today. Thank you for making this space to invite Jesus into your homes, into your families, into your own lives during this time. Uh, we hope that Jesus meets with you and speaks to you personally today. Well, we just finished three weeks of Fast Pray Love, which was great. Three weeks away from social media, focusing on Jesus, asking Jesus to come, to move in our lives, to move in our country, to move in our church. And it's been really good. Thank you for joining with us uh, during this time. I've been really encouraged by what Jesus has been up to in our church. And with that, our growth goal for this entire time period has been unity. We've based it off of Romans 12, 16 that says, treat each other well, live together in harmony. That's the Stephen abridged version. But it says that, uh, that we need to live together in harmony. And so we've been working towards that. And alongside of that, we are starting a series called Unity Being Made One today. Today is the first day of it. So we're continuing what's been going on through Fast Pray Love. We're continuing in this growth goal, and we're speaking directly to that. How can we be made one as followers of Jesus in this thing that we call a church and Sarah's going to start us off today by speaking about unity, even when you might be tempted to be offended. I think it's going to be really good. I'm excited for what Jesus is going to say to us. But first, we have a new song for this week. We recorded it live at a worship and prayer night that we had a little over a week ago. It's called Graves into Gardens. I'm excited about it. And then immediately following that, we have a really great way for you to be able to join us in loving our community that we do every year at Thanksgiving. So we have lots of good stuff. We're really happy that you're here. Thanks for joining us and let's go. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise Treasures that fade never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire Now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than Nothing is better than you. I'm 
Hey, Mariam. Can you believe it's Thanksgiving again? Unbelievable. I'm really excited because this year, you, you wouldn't believe we already have 90 plus basket requests. And they're still coming. 90? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, you think of what's going on now with everybody losing their jobs or on furlough. Or, you know, people now more than ever need our help and are reaching out to us. It's so, true. It's great that people trust us enough to call, but 100 baskets this year? Do you know when we started about hmm, 15, 16 years ago, we had seven baskets? <laughs> That's crazy. And now this year it could be 107. So things haven't really changed that much. We're still providing families with the, with the fresh produce as well as the cans and the turkey. Don't forget the turkey. Yeah. Um, so this year we're going to do it a little differently. People are going to drive through. Is that what you were telling me? So yeah. So I mean, we still have a lot of deliveries, but we're um, we're trying to do this drive-through thing because it'll be really fun, and we can maintain social distance. We can keep our masks on. People will feel safe, and I think the delivery people, as well as the people picking up, will feel joyful and safe. Okay, I know we do We do actually need all the same help that we always got and then a little bit more because we're doing the drive-through. So you mentioned we need people um, on the Friday, I think it's the 20th, that to meet here and help put the baskets together. That's Friday night, right? Friday night, yeah. 7 o'clock? Yeah, 7 o'clock. Um, then we also need people um, to help with the shopping, people to help handing out the food here at the drive-through. Lots of people, we could use a lot of people here at the drive through between praying, um, we're gonna do a little craft, a thankful tree or something where people get to write down something that they're thankful for. Um, we're gonna have, maybe we'll do some balloon making. So anybody who wants to help with that on Sunday from one to three, we need people for that. We, need, we still need people to do deliveries. Okay. Um, so we talked about the shopping. Yeah. Okay, so there's another thing that um, is really important to me in all the years that we've done this. Putting this together for people who need it is so helpful for those of us in the church. It gives us a sense of being able to do something. True. But I've over the years realized a lot of people have come to me and said, Liz, you know what? I'm just not into making bows. I don't want to shop. And now people are saying, Liz, I don't want to come to church. I don't feel comfortable with COVID, but I want to help. I want to do something. And like, there's lots of different ways. Number one, praying. That's always a good idea if you want to help. But there's another thing. Some people have been really affected by COVID financially, and they are in the position this year where they can't give financially and they need. Mm. But we live in an area of the country where some people haven't been affected financially as much and they still have the resources they had before, but maybe not as much time because now life is a little crazier. So I want to encourage people, if you want to help but you can't do any of the things we've talked about, we need your help. We have over a hundred baskets going out this year, which is our, normally we give about 75 or 80. So we're going to need about $2,000 in order to make this happen. So I've always, over the years, joked with people like, please help us if you can, if you want to, and no check is ever too big to share the love of Jesus. <laughs> that's really great, Liz. Thanks for mentioning that because that's always the hardest ask is to ask for money. But um, I'm just so excited that there's so many ways for people to get involved and um, it's just gonna be an amazing year. We're gonna be able to bless so many people, those who get to help, and those who get to receive. So here goes to another year of Thanksgiving baskets. Yes, indeed. This is the gateway to unforgiveness. I had a whole nother message ready to go, didn't I, Charles? And the Holy Spirit said, Mike, they didn't understand the offense thing fully. <laughs> they didn't really get how offense is creating a prison of unforgiveness for them. And if they don't learn how to deal with the offense at the moment, they will wind up in a place in a space that they never thought was possible for them to get in. And God says we need to understand that if unforgiveness is the place we don't want to be, we have to start with the offense.
Because offense is either picked up or put on. But somebody falls sick and you say that's what they get? Sound like a curse to me? And I think my Bible says blessing and cursing are coming out of this same tongue, that unstableness. At the moment, I'm like, what is going on? Well, I can be offended by so many little things. And this is what the Holy Spirit told me. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, you need to get this because there's a parallel that is happening in the world and in the church that there should be a difference, but it's looking a little bit like the same. It's coming from. And the Holy Spirit told me, Michael, offense is the currency of our culture, but forgiveness is the currency of the kingdom. Oh, that's good. The currency of our culture is offense. That's why we can cancel somebody after one mistake. That's why if they, if they do the wrong thing or wear fur and I'm for PETA and all this, like we be canceling people for all kind of stuff. Like, Good morning. You know, a couple of years ago, my husband and I had friends over for Thanksgiving, back when we could have friends over for Thanksgiving. It's one of the things I like about the Thanksgiving holiday. It's not always the same group of people for us. Uh, one Thanksgiving growing up, my extended family in Albany, one of my uncles picked up a hitchhiker, and we had Thanksgiving with a, a hitchhiker. One of our friends, uh, family friends, they always invite international students over from the college. The college randomly assigns uh, international students who have nowhere else to go. And so they get an uh, interesting conversation with people from other countries and cultures who will never meet again. But for, for us, a couple of years ago uh, in Connecticut, we had these friends over, really enjoy them. Uh, they couldn't make it back to California to have Thanksgiving with their family. So they, they did the meal with us. And of course, you know, I tried my best with the turkey. It's not the, the center of my culinary talents. Um, and I've got certain side dishes I really like, the mac and cheese, the, the, the greens. Um, I think I prepared a great meal. We had a good time together with them. Um, my, my friend, she talked a lot about her family, what they did for Thanksgiving, um, describing the great uh, um, meals, the great um, dishes that her family made. And um, probably the third or fourth culinary masterpiece she described, I started to feel a little hmm, something. And as I washed dishes later that afternoon, I realized what that feeling was. It was a fence. Now, my, my friend wasn't doing anything wrong. You know, she was no insults, very, very pleasant. She was reminiscing about family and, and traditions she probably just missed. But, you know, in my mind, I had this idea of me and, and, and my, my cooking and uh, as kind of my own culinary masterpieces. And she just wasn't quite playing into my mental script, how I wished, how, how I wanted I don't think that I'm easily offended or, or certainly frequently offended, but when I am, oh, well, look, there it is. Someone didn't like my idea, didn't validate me how I thought they would, grouped me in a group that I didn't think I belonged to or, or left me out of a grouping that, that I wished I belonged to. You know, I why, why was I not invited? How do they really see me? How could they think I was wrong about that? especially with everything that is going on right now, it is easy to get offended. And being offended just sucks the life and joy out of us. Being offended is nothing new. We can go back to the very, very beginning of the Bible to see how some of these dynamics played out. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 4. And then God has some good, helpful things to say to us about what it means to be offended, how we can get over it, and how we can live in unity and, and harmony with one another to enjoy life and enjoy each other more. Let's pray together before we turn to Scripture. And Jesus, this morning uh, we come before you, Jesus, and we want your thoughts and your feelings to be our thoughts and our feelings, Jesus. Would your love and your approval be the measuring line in our lives, deep down in our souls, coming up into our hearts and our minds, flowing out in how we speak to and interact with others? Jesus, we receive your love and your grace over our lives this morning. And we ask, Jesus, that you would speak to us in your word, Jesus. Would you touch us and change us? 
We value your scripture and your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so looking at Genesis, uh, I told you the very, very beginning of the Bible. You'll find it right there, Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam and his wife Eve became pregnant. Um, This is starting in uh, verse 1. And she gave birth to Cain, and she said, With the Lord's help I have produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lamb from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift. He did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. Now, quick pause here. Do you feel like God is being unfair to Cain? I mean, Cain gives him a gift. It might not be the best gift, but like, you know, why is he playing favorites? I want you to bookmark that if you you feel that way. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? Will you not be accepted if you do what's right? But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. One day Cain suggested to his brother, hey, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and ended up killing him. Afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, where's your brother? Where's Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? Am I my brother's keeper? Like, ugh, how am I supposed to know this? Like, get, get, get off of me, God. But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from this ground which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops from you. No matter how hard you work from now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me to bear. Hold on, dude. You killed your own brother, like your own brother. Um, But he says, this punishment is too great for me. You have banished me from your land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, no, for I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. So the Lord put a mark on Cain to protect him, to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence. He settled uh, in the community of the land of Nod with some other folks east of Eden. Um, And there he lived out the rest of his natural days. Well, the name Cain means to get, possess, claim. He's the firstborn. He's a taker. Uh, The name Abel means a breath or, or a vapor. It's a pretty ominous foreshadowing of what will be of his life. Cain comes up to the altar with some of the fruits. It's kind of like he's like, mm, well, let, let me get you a gift, God. What can I, um, mm, oh, here, this will do. Abel, by, by contrast, gets the best of the firstborn fatted uh, lamb. He, he brings a really good offering. God calls Cain and gives him an opportunity to redo, an opportunity for growth, to, to be better. You know, Cain, you just want to redo this part of the quiz. Like, look this over. You'll get an A if you do. He does not. He does not want to improve. He does not want to be better. Instead, he lets offense consume him and eat at his subconscious, and then it spills over in really irrational violence. Cain did not believe in the goodness of God. Uh, God says to him, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Don't I love you just as much? Can't we make this better? And Cain says, no. No, we can't. Uh, He did not have a growth mindset. He was hurt. He was offended. Um, He said, I did not get the recognition that I wanted. Me, Cain, the firstborn, the taker, the possessor. I don't trust you to love and accept me. I must fight for myself. Stand up for myself. Not not redo my my gift. Not, Not receive the gift of your acceptance. And even in punishment. 
that this guy responds with a self-centered response. You know, I messed up and now I have to pay for it. You know, wo woe is me. Self-pity and, and self-absorption instead of with repentance. If he had repented, I mean, God told him, if you uh, redo your gift, I I'll accept it. Maybe he would have accepted his repentance too. But Cain did not want any of that, even in the face of his uh, self-centeredness and, and terrible attitude, though, God has grace. God protected him. God, God gives him some sort of a, a covering, a, a face tattoo, seal, whatever it is, marks and blesses him and promises that no one will harm him as, as he leaves and, and goes out for his, uh, his consequence. And this honestly is the big point of the story. God provides. God, God has grace. God keeps on giving. Cain took. God gave. Cain took. God gave. Cain took. He demanded. He wanted. It was about him, him himself, the firstborn. God encouraged, counseled, pr protected. God's protective grace is really the, the end of this story. Cain rejected it. He, he tied a leaden weight of himself around his neck, me, my rights, my rightness, my, my image, my respect, instead of living in the land of God's grace and acceptance and forgiveness. And for us too, if we can live in God's grace, we will also live in peace and harmony with our brothers and sisters. If we receive grace, we won't take offense so easily. We'll live in unity and harmony with one another. Because God is acceptance and, and grace. And acceptance is the antidote to offense. Grace is free. Acceptance is for everyone. Grace loves me and loves others. Now, this isn't to be confused with standing up against legitimate hurt and oppression and injustice. The Bible tells us to do that, to stand up for the marginalized, the, those who are suffering under injustice. And you know, we don't want to enable sin in others. If people are being offensive or, or insulting, we don't want to roll out the red carpet and be like, no, no, just keep doing it. That's, you know, enabling bad things and that's not a helpful Christian uh, community. We are supposed to stand up for others and supposed to stand up for ourselves. And here's, here's how I kind of think of it, and others you know, may have thought about this in, in different ways or, or better ways. But I think of a, um, abuse as anything that tears down who we are as humans created in God's image. You know, racial stereotypes, um, devaluing the worth of people, harmful and hurtful ideas that limit the, the potential of people to develop and flourish how God created them. Anything that devalues our worth as human beings, that's abuse. Now, insult tears down who we are as individuals. Our unique capacities, gifting, skills, what we do. Um, can be insulted when we re disrespect or, or devalue the contributions of, of people. That's insulting and not good, right? And then offense. Offense tears down our preferred ideas about ourselves. So there's, uh, there's our human worth, our individual skills and talents, and then there's our preferred ideas about ourselves. Cain was offended when God suggested that he tr try again. He liked to think that he got everything right the first time. Offense is not defending over uh, against abuse, to standing up for good causes, noble and good causes that we should have some righteous anger about. Offense occurs when we try to protect our idea of ourselves. In the book, Thanks for the Feedback, um, they, they call it an identity trigger. Um, as the feedback challenges the ideas that we hold about ourselves, it's possible that this will be kind of destabilizing for us. We can lash out against feedback that kind of comes against our ideas of ourselves. This book says whether we have a, a fixed mentality or a growth mentality really determines how we, we take feedback on an identity level. I really like the book, uh, Thanks for the Feedback. It's um, been helpful to me to think about how I personally take feedback myself. So they call it an identity trigger. I call it my shiny self, my Instagram self, my uh, go out, get yourself together self. It's who I like to be. And our shiny selves take a lot of work to maintain. Your, what's your public self? What do you like people to think about you? 
It is a lot of work to maintain sometimes. Some of us have a hard working, competent, shiny self. So good at stuff, you know, not marred by failure. And it's important to that others see us as not failing. Some of us have intelligent, reasonable, thoughtful, projected selves. Pretty much, you know, careful, thinking things through. Uh, so if somebody gives you a look like, hmm, that was a dumb idea, you might get offended. Some of us have popular public selves, you know, likable, respected, never in real conflict with others. So if you suspect that someone else doesn't like you, you're offended because it comes against the idea of who you are as a person. But we all fail. We're all wrong. Nobody is liked by everyone. What image of yourself do you like to promote? Is it important to you that others uh, know what you do? Know how much you do for other people? Maybe it's important to you that people think you are strong. You got it. You're good. You know, for myself, uh, it's important to me that uh, people think that I'm competent. That I can do stuff, that you know, success is important to me. I was raised in a home that really valued uh, correct ideas and hard work. Being busy was like a badge of honor, like, oh, so busy, so hardworking. These are, ideas are important to me, I mean, and, and I get offended if people think, you know, oh, I'm just phoning it in or, or I'm not, not good at stuff. These are the ideas that are just happen to be important to me. And being confronted with any like question mark about your preferred image of yourself, it can feel like people are defacing the promo poster of, of you. Like, hey, you didn't like my, my profile picture? I chose it. I, I thought it was really good and, and you don't even like it enough. What's up with that? You know, I met a uh, friend for brunch, again, back when we could meet up with friends for, for meals. And uh, we don't live super close together. Um, so we met up at this nice little cafe and enjoyed, you know, it was a Saturday morning, French toast. It was just great. I really like this friend. She's doing great things with her life. And um, she came in and she just looked great. She had that slept in Saturday morning energy and glow about her. She's wearing this denim jacket with a cute little blouse and matching earrings. And she's just a very pretty girl uh, just all the time. But she, we were just happy and relaxed and she just looked great. Um, and at some point in time, I said, you know, hey, if grad school doesn't work out, there's always modeling. And she got just like a little bit of a funny look on her face. And I realized that wasn't quite the right thing uh, to say. Um, and then later we were texting and uh, it turns out that she was offended by my, my comments. I felt, I just, guys, I felt really bad because I just, I, I'm proud of what she's doing. I, I really believe in uh, what she's doing with her life. I think she's super talented. I just meant that she looked really beautiful. And then I thought, oh, I shouldn't have said that in like a negative way, the semantics on that. Like, why couldn't I have just said you look really nice, not if grad school do doesn't work out. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I, I felt bad. But obviously, in her preferred image of herself and how she likes people to think of her, it's a much bigger deal that people think that grad school will work out than that people think she's really beautiful. That's a more important ideal to her than uh, to the others, than, than the other part. <sighs> Anyways, I, I felt bad. So how should we handle offense? Well, first, like my friend, she should talk to me, not to other people. Uh, talk to the person, handle conflict well, bring it out into the open. It's honestly, not that hard. Just be like, hey, when you said, if grad school doesn't work out, you should go into modeling like, I I've took that as kind of like, I don't know, do you think uh, grad school will work? You know, talk about it. It's not that hard. Definitely don't talk about it with somebody else. Deal with it with the, with the person. Um, that's just how the, these things get better, how we actually move forwards. I'm a mark of maturity and handling conflict well. Um, assume the best in the other person. Think about their background. Think about where they're coming from. We need to stand up for ourselves. We need to stand up for others, but we want to be very pro other people in that, assuming the best in them, being for them, even as we stand up for ourselves. And I think examining your own feelings is super important. What exactly is bothering you? I like journaling for this. Um, sometimes halfway through journaling, I realize, oh, 
that's really not a big deal. I can let that go. Oh, that's what's bothering me. I, I realize uh, some of these things. Let's look as we close at a good example with Jesus of being offended. Well, actually, in some ways, Jesus isn't the best part of this example because he says some things that are offensive and kind of wrong, but he's opening up a grace and growth path. You know, I could try and explain it for you, but let's just look at this passage together. It's Mark chapter 15, uh, verses 21 through 28. So Jesus, he leaves the Galilee, leaves Israel, goes out uh, to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And a Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, saying to him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. She had some really uh, big issues that she needed dealing with. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word then his disciples urged him to just send her away, tell her to go away. They said she's bothering us with all her begging. Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. You know, we'll see this opening up. Uh, Israel becomes the church. But Jesus at that point in time, especially he was a Jewish rabbi in Israel. She came and worshiped him, pleading again. Right? That didn't deter her. She pleaded, she pleaded again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Ouch! Yikes! What? She replied, That's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said, Your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. He performs the miracle that she so desperately needed. He gives her the grace, the provision for her, her family, this healing, this miracle. Because the woman says, yes. I, I, I know, you know, I'm, I'm, you're Jewish, I, I'm not. You have a calling to, to the Jewish people first, me second. But your seconds are enough. She says, yes, but even the pet dogs eat from that same table, and I'm here for mine. She says, with you, Jesus, I swim in an ocean of grace. There is acceptance. There is more. You don't run out, Jesus. I'm not here to, to grab, to defend, to, to take. I'm here simply to receive from the overflow. She says, I know that your leftovers are plenty because it's not about me. It's about you. And I'm not going to pretend to be somebody. I'm not. I'm not going to pretend to be Jewish, but I'm not going to pretend you're someone you're not either. You are Jesus, and you have plenty. You have more. You have provision, and you have grace. Tim Keller says that this is a uh, rightful-less assertion. It's assertion, a, a claim without uh, saying that you deserve it or, or you're, you're right or um, you, you deserve it. It's based on God's goodness and God's grace. This woman is the opposite of Cain. She has a, a growth mentality. She has a forwards mentality. She isn't worried about her image. She has like a zero negative identity triggers. She does not have an image of herself to promote, no, no shiny self to maintain or defend. She saw God as generous not withholding. She saw God as having abundance that she could receive, not little that she had to pry from his grip. You know, if you ask anyone about taking offense and what to do, they will, they will give you the advice as to, you know, look at it from the other person's point of view. Look at this episode from the other person's point of view. I would suggest this morning as we end to look at it from God's point of view. We do swim in an ocean of grace. God is not holding out on us. We do not have to promote ourselves. We do not have to protect ourselves. Let's commit this morning to receiving God's real love for our real self instead of taking offense to, to slights against our shiny selves. Friends, this morning, let's be like this woman and say, you're Jesus. I'm me. You have plenty for me. In this world, I am a receiver. I'm going to receive grace from you, not take offense from others. Let's pray together. 
Jesus, we thank you. Um, even in the ups and downs of, of relationships and life, that we can depend on your goodness. We do say this morning that you have plenty for us. That you are a God of abundance. You are not holding out on us. But that you have grace and love and provision and goodness and healing and power to cover every situation, every circumstance. And Jesus, this morning we commit to not trying to promote ourselves or, or protect images or ideas about ourselves, Jesus. But we want to let those things go and receive fully your grace and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit Your goodness, let us 
become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, right here, in our hearts, in our homes. Holy Spirit, you are welcome to set the priorities. You are welcome to speak truth to us, to guide us. We welcome you right here, right here. And friends, this morning, um, I want us to pray, um, especially over anyone who feels like God is like holding out or withholding from them. Just take a minute and kind of examine your own heart. Just kind of examine how you feel about God, how you feel like God feels about you. And if you feel like God is kind of holding back from you, that's you. We want to pray together this morning. We have a loving, generous Heavenly Father who loves you so much, who has good plans, good, good desires, good designs for you right here and right now. Jesus, um, I pray that all of us would see you as full of grace and full of generosity. Jesus, sometimes we're not full of grace and generosity and our image of you is not full of grace and generosity. But would we see you as our loving Heavenly Father who loves us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. Um, the, you, you gave a punishment to, to Cain in that passage, or to uh, Cain, yes, in that passage that we read. But as we continue through scripture, you take the punishment on yourself. You provide for us in every way. In Jesus' death and in his resurrection to bring us into new life. And would we live in confidence and peace and joy knowing we have a loving Heavenly Father who just loves us so, so much that God is for us, not against us. Our Heavenly Father is on our side and we have so much confidence in this life because of that. And then friends, this morning I also want to pray for any of you who um, may have offense or, or conflict with others. We want to handle offense and conflict well, um, to talk to the other person about it, to, to bring it up, to make it better. If you're offended by anything I've said, talk to me about it, bring it to me. Let's deal with this together as brothers and sisters in Christ, because we know that we can make it better. Let's pray together. If that's you, if you have something that somebody has, has said that's bothered you, you some, some statement, 
um, some, some action that people have taken or not taken, not invited you. Let's bring that to Jesus and let's handle that well. Lord God, right now I pray uh, over anyone uh, watching who, who may have been uh, slighted or insulted or hurt or offended, Jesus, I pray over them the, the courage and the grace uh, to deal with this well, to bring out into the open, to talk about this uh, with the other person to make it better, Jesus. Would you make us people um, who handle conflict well and we're peacemakers, we're truth bringers, Jesus. Um, don't just stew on things, but bring it out into the open because we believe that you make these situations better when we deal with them. So I just pray that over people, that, that grace and that courage to deal with it well. Psalm 131 says, My heart is not proud, Lord, nor are my eyes haughty or stuck up. I have not concerned myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed myself and quieted my ambitions. I'm like a child with its mother. I am content. Put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Yes, hope in the Lord. This morning, Jesus, we do say we will be content with you and we will put our hope and our trust and our faith in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us here today. Uh, it's been a really good Sunday. We're grateful for you being a part of uh, our church and what Jesus is doing here. We pray that you have a great week. We love you. We're for you. And we'll see you next week.